Now it actually turns out that the force on a charged particle in a conductor in the magnetic field generates a potential difference across our conductor. This effect was first observed by the American physicist Edwin Hall back in 1879 and is now known as the Hall effect. Now the Hall effect is actually very useful because it gives us a way to relate electric potentials which are relatively easy to measure to the magnetic field strength. And so this is actually how the magnetic field probe that you'll use in the lab works. It's also known as a Hall probe. So it measures the potential which is generated across it and translates this into a magnetic field strength, which will let you measure the magnetic field strength of the Earth and also the magnetic field strength inside a solenoid. So in order to picture how this works, I want you to imagine this conductor here. So this conductor has a length L in the X direction and it's got a current I flowing in the X direction as well. It's got a height H in the Z direction and a width W in the Y direction. Now let's impose a magnetic field B in the Y direction on this conductor. Now what we can do is work out, well, what is the force on each of those electrons which is moving through this conductor? So the force on the charged particles is going to be given by F is equal to QV cross B. And in this case, the charge, because we've got an electron, Q is E, the electrons are moving with the drift speed, VD, and magnetic field strength has been given. So the Electrons are moving in the opposite direction to the current, so in the negative x direction, and the magnetic field is going in the y direction. So the magnitude of the force on them is going to be equal to E V D B because the velocity and the magnetic field are perpendicular, so sine of 90 is 1. Now we can use our right hand rule to work out the direction of this force. So in this case, we've got negative particles, so they're going in the negative x direction, and the magnetic field is going in the y direction. So because these are negative particles, the force is out the back of our hand, so it, it's going to feel a force up. So we're going to end up with lots of electrons up the top of our conductor because the electrons are free to move and so we'll move up there. Now if we have more electrons up the top of our conductor than down the bottom, we're going to end up with an electric field. So this electric field is going to point towards the negative particles. So it's going to be pointing upwards. And so the electrons are going to feel a force due to this electric field, and that force is in the opposite direction to the field because electrons are negative. And so the electric field which is established is going to push them back downwards. So what will happen is we'll keep on getting electrons accumulating along the top until we've reached an equilibrium where the magnetic force pushing the electrons up is balanced with the electric force pushing them down. So we can write an expression for the size of that electric force. We know that F is equal to EQ. So in this case, we can write, well, the electric force FE is equal to E, the charge on an electron, times E subscript H, where E subscript H stands for our whole electric field. And so now what we'll do is we'll balance this magnetic and electric force. So we've now got EVDB, is equal to E times EH. So the little E's cancel and we end up with, well, our Hall electric field is equal to VD times B, where VD is the drift velocity. So we can now use this to calculate the potential difference in that Z direction where the electric field is established. So we know that the potential difference is equal to minus the integral of E dot DS. So in this case, we can write, well, the magnitude of the potential difference between the top and the bottom is equal to the integral from zero to H of EH, which is the whole electric field, which is a constant electric field, DZ. And so this is just equal to EH times H. So that tells us the size of this whole voltage. So let's have a look at a problem that we can solve with this now. 
So the question is, a rectangular copper strip carries a current of 5.0 amps along its length. Its height is 1.5 centimetres and its width is 0 0.10 centimetres. A 1.2 Tesla magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the strip in the direction of its width. Copper has a density of 8920 kilograms per meter cubed and a molar mass of 0 0.0635 kilograms per mole. It has one valence electron. And we're asked, find the Hall voltage for this case. Okay, so let's draw a little diagram. So here we go, we've got a strip and it's got some length along this way, which we don't know, a width of 0 0.10 centimeters and a height of 1.5 centimeters. And the magnetic field is perpendicular to the strip. So it's like this, and that's a 1.2 Tesla field and it's carrying a current along its length. So that's coming out this end and I is equal to five amps. And what we want to know is, well, what is the Hall voltage? And we've just seen that the Hall voltage is given by the Hall electric field times the height. And we saw that the Hall electric field was given by the drift velocity times the magnetic field. And then we've still got this height H here. So in order to work out what this is, we're going to need to know what the drift velocity is. We know the magnetic field um, it, that's given as 1.2 Teslas and the height we've got as 1.5 centimeters. So going back to what we know about current, we know that the current is equal to NEVDA and A is the cross section through which the current's flowing. So in this case, this is the height times the width. So this is equal to NEVDHW, which tells us that VD is equal to I divided by NEHW. And we know everything here apart from N, which is the number of charge carriers per unit volume. So N is number of charge carriers per unit volume. But we can work out N from what we're given because we're given information about the density and we know it's molar mass. And we also know that it has one valence electron, which means that each of these copper atoms is going to donate one electron to that sea of electrons. So each copper atom has donates one charge carrier. So the number of charge carriers is going to be the density, which is given in kilograms per meter cubed, divided by the molar mass, which is in kilograms per mole. So you can see that by doing this division, the kilograms will cancel out and we'll end up with something in moles per meter cubed. So if we want to know how many atoms in a meter cubed, we actually need to times this by Avogadro's number, which tells us how many atoms in a mole. So this mole will then cancel with that mole and we'll end up with atoms per meter cubed. So this is equal to 8920 divided by 0 0.0635 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23. And when we solve that, we get 3.41 times 10 to the 26 atoms per meter cubed. Okay, so now we have N, so now we can go back to the start. So we're trying to find out this Hall voltage and that is equal to, we've got the B times H and then times VD and VD is I divided by NEHW 
And so you can see the H's cancel out and now we can substitute everything that we've been given in. So B is 1.2 Teslas, I is 5 amps, N we've just calculated here, 3.41 times 10 to the 26. E, that's a charge on an electron, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. And then W, that's given here, 0 0.10 centimeters. So that's 0 0.0010 meters. So we can now solve this on the calculator and when we do we end up with 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4 volts as our whole voltage to two significant figures.